Hi everyone, it's your boy, number one Marmaduke fan. This is take two for my review of Outlander's book 30. Not book XXX, moms of the internets. It's Roman numerals for 30, okay? This is not a goily magazine, 30. So, uh, I've been collecting very random issues of American manga out of my comic book shop's 25 cent bin. Mostly just kind of out of an interest in, oh, hey, look at that. I wonder how, how they Americanized it. Isn't that interesting? Oh, they have a nice little letters column. Oh, look, they did this nice little American cover, cover art. Because I'm more used to reading manga in the authentic format where they preserve the right to left reading and they preserve all the Japanese sound effects. And I think I may have found a really interesting little hidden gem here. Something that was kind of popular in the early 90s and has gone down the memory hole a little bit. So some of the letter columns from these, you know, 90s American weebs, we love you from the current year, oh weebs of 1991. There's some really effusive praise for the series in, in these letters. And I really got a strong, good vibe from the, from just this one book. Now, the elephant in the room is I'm reading book 30, and this all is the text you need to read to understand what the heck is going on. Seven solid paragraphs. I kind of had to, like, memorize it to figure out what the whole plot situation is, because this is a pretty complicated space opera plot. It's like Star Wars in the sense that it's in space, and there's, you know, this high-octane energy with, you know, simple fantasy characters. But unlike Star Wars, which has an evil empire and the good guy rebellion. This has multiple factions at odds with one another with various goals, and I'm really interested in that. So I'm going to try really hard to figure out how I can get this series, because some of the paperbacks you can still get. Some of them, you know, the people are scalping the prices a bit, but uh, boy, uh, it's, it's like it's Star Wars, but maybe with a bit more of a Game of Thrones, Thrones style war and complexity vibe to it. Now, uh, the elephant in the room, I think, for Joji Manabe is this art style is very reminiscent of Ranma One Half and Inuyasha. It just, to my eye, it looks like a lot of late 80s, early 90s manga really adopted that super cartoony anime style. And there are a couple points where I got a little sick of it. Like the, the faces were getting distorted a little too much for comedic effect, and it was a little tiresome, but I forgive it because it was a product of its time. And Joji Manabe has some real strengths as a comic artist that I think are worth calling attention to. So because this is issue 30, I'm not going to try to sum up all of this nonsense for you. This is just going to be more about the strengths of this particular book and of Manabe's co comic style. So observation one is lots of clear influence, I think, of the Star Wars films, big giant spaceships, filling the sky from underneath and even kind of a Slave Leia style outfit on Princess Calm. And uh, strength number one is, uh, even though I said that I sometimes got sick of the exaggerated cartoony style, it still has a lot of charm and it has the effect of adding a comedic element to what is otherwise a pretty serious and straightforward Star Wars style space opera story. You know, I kind of like, it's kind of cute how she's sort of jutting out her jaw as she gets ready to fight. And I re really wanted to talk about this panel. So uh, I talk a lot about some of the conventions in manga, like the action lines and uh, the narrow panel compositions. But the thing is, if you don't have fundamental drawing uh, skills, all of those little dress up things aren't going to be able to hide the fact that you don't have a good grasp of human anatomy or fundamental drawing. Now, ironically, Manabe does have fairly weak uh, understanding of the human body compared to other manga artists, but this is a really solid panel. We're getting down low for a worm's eye view. We're looking up. She's got a good expression. She's raised, raising her arms. Her cape is filling the page. So these action lines are a cool aspect of what makes manga art manga art, all this extra energy and motion in it. But this is an example of where the fundamental drawing is working with the conventions to create a, a good total effect. And the other at, this relates to the other aspect of what Manabe is really good at. Perfect segue. Manabe is good at having moments of push and pull or big moments and then small moment, small moment, small moment, big moment. And that's important for giving us some tension and giving us a relaxing moment and then giving us an exciting moment and then back to 
the steady pace. It's fantastic. So this was an example of that with, you know, lots of little scenes leading up to the big scene. And then lots of little scenes, tight, tightly controlled uh, with characters interacting. Here's that face I was talking about. So this face of like a big wah expression shows up a lot. It's, you know, it's supposed to be silly and goofy. I just got tired of seeing that same style of face over and over and over again. But I won't, I won't throw too much shade on it. That, that, that's a, it's a product of its time. And it is also trying to create this sort of comedic tone to an otherwise fairly serious story. So, you know, tight, 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 tight. And then boom, I love this page. So one thing I love about it is even the gutter is helping this page work. After all of these tight moments, we zoom back, we get this big epic shot filling the page with uh, our boy, the protagonist, really tiny in front of it. It's not even ridiculously detailed if you zoom in. There's a lot of white and a lot of solid black and the detailed parts have a little sketchiness to them. They're not tightly defined. But what makes this page work so beautifully is everything is telling you to look up and be impressed by the grandeur of this architecture, including this gutter. A less sensible or less experienced artist might have filled this whole page or might have had, you know, some extra gunk over here. And by having this really clear gutter, we are pointed straight up here to this to the edge of this page. And this reminds me of what Bill Watterson wrote that I'll never forget. The eye being lazy is attracted to white. In comics where you use a white gutter, that is so critical that you have to consider how that'll affect the whole page because the eye likes looking at white things. So in this case, it's not an arrow, but it's sort of this U, this bowl is containing us here. So every time we go down here, we bounce right back up and get this grand effect. And you rest here for a moment. After a tightly paced boom, 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 boom story, you get a big moment. And there are several of these in just one issue. I'll show you another one since that probably won't spoil too many plot points. So, you know, uh, so let's get the feel for it. You know, tight, 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 boom. Que bella. I love it. So uh, I am really impressed by this. I'm going to Try to pick up the paperbacks, I think, but uh, it's kind of kind of a gem, a, a product of its time. Some weebishness, if you can't stand sort of the weebishness in some manga, this that might make it tough for you. But Manabe really gets how to pace a story and to use different elements together in a story, and uh, and it's this. It, and I, I've already pre read a few comics where I said, "Boy, this is kind of like Star Wars," but better than the Star Wars comics. This is like Star Wars in that it's taking some influence from Star Wars and in some of the way the spaceships are drawn and maybe some of the outfits. But Outlanders also has its own vibe in how the war go goes down. It's a bit more of a complicated turf war than it is a simple evil empire versus rebellion war. So I'm really happy with this. This might be a tough one for you to find, Yang. Uh, try to get the paperbacks. Try to see if your comic book shop has some old issues that you may have missed if you can't get some of the paperbacks. Uh, I'm sorry to say it, but this is one where you might have to go online to find some of the missing chapters, but uh, definitely worth it. And I'm, I, I, what I think I might be doing, podcast versus phone, is I think I might use the phone for some quick observational vids about what I'm reading and why I like it. And I think I'll save the podcasts for big picture things. Like when I reviewed all of uh, a whole story arc of Darkwing Duck, and I tried to give you a feel for the strengths of the entire story arc. But for single issues, I, I was really tempted to do a podcast of this because I thought that'll be more professional. But I realized that I really like holding the book in my hand. I like flipping to the letters column and showing you that. I like kind of having the flexibility to show you a few things that uh, that might catch my eye other than the really big things I want to talk about. So I think the phone might be back to stay, at least for informal comic book reviews. Anyway, I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys, and I will catch you later.